Welcome in the name of the Lord. We are glad you are worshiping with us this morning. There are a few announcements printed on the back of the bulletin. And are there any other announcements? Please stand and greet one another as you feel comfortable in the name of the Lord and remain standing for the doxology. Morning. Good morning. Logan? Yep. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. <clears throat> Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Thank you, Lord for this wonderful and amazing blessing of today, for your word of hope which gives us strength, for your love that makes our life meaningful, for your peace that gives us comfort, for your grace that renews and restores our life. We give you praise, Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is Sweet, Sweet Spirit on page 134. Our responsive reading from today comes from Psalm 104, 
24 through 35 on page 941. As usual, I will read the odd number of verses and you will respond with the even. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There the ships go to and fro, and your Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. May my meditation be pleasing to him, but as I rejoice in the Lord. The scripture reading from today comes from Acts 2, 1 through 21, on page 1692, if you'd like to follow along. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in others' tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews and every nation under heaven. <clears throat> when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are you not these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medias, and Elamites, residents and Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Pyrigia and Paphilia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them own declaring the words, the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, We have too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and gracious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's join together in the glory, Patri.
Please join me for a time of confession. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know the whole heart is that still pain. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You know the restless worries that are on me to breath. The fears that drive me. You can turn my thoughts from afar. You know what I have tempted to conceal from everyone else. You know why I do what I do when I don't even know myself. Forgive me and help me, gracious God. Help me to lay aside my faithless fears. Forgive my inability to trust you in all things. Help me to overcome the hurts of the past. Help me to give up using them and to use them for my present situation. I am the work of your hand. Fulfill your purpose in me. I ask this in the name of Jesus, my Savior and Lord. Amen. Now for a personal reflection and prayer. Amen. May the God of mercy, who forgives all of us our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. As Jesus healed the afflicted and restored those who have died, he also forgives our sins and gives us new life. Amen. Are there any special joys or concerns of the church? Graduation was yesterday. Any others? Yes? Pray for the family of Bonnie and who? Okay. Pray for our service people. Any others? Oh God, in a world that seems to have gone crazy and lost its way, we come to you this morning not just seeking answers, but seeking strength and courage for the days ahead. We pray for courage to be with the people you have called us to be, people who seek justice and peace for your love of all your people. We struggle with questions that seem to have no answer and problems that have immeasurable, immeasur insurmountable solutions. We know that your love is all in compassioning, never ending, always forgiving. This is our hope, that you love us unconditionally. For we know and struggle with our perfections and our shortcomings. Know all the while that in the end it is you who loves us the most and is always there waiting for us. You are our hope for the world and it is in this hope that we live. God, this morning we lift up families and friends who have lost loved ones. Give them strength and courage for the days ahead. This morning we lift up those in our congressional who are sick or hurting in any way. Give them peace and strength to face their situations. All things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Now we welcome Joe Vitek up to our pulpit. Good 
Good morning, everybody. I'm going to find my way here to the Gospel of John. And uh, follow me, uh, follow along with me if you want. Um, we're going to go to chapter 15. And we're going to read, um, oh, verses, I think it's 26 and 27. And then we're going to jump over to chapter 17, or 16, rather. Starting at uh, verse 26 of chapter 15. It says, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. Um, then we'll jump to verse 4. I have told you this so that when the time comes you will remember that I warned you, and I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. And unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, uh, much more or more than you can uh, now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I say the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Um, the Gospel of the Lord. So, um, pretty much, you know, in a, in a nutshell, um, the Gospel reading has, um, oh, probably three themes. One is... Um, Jesus is leaving, right? And the other one is the disciples are staying. And then the third theme is, is that even though I'm leaving and you're staying, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send uh, to you the Holy Spirit. So today we celebrate Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday. And... Um, Pentecost, um, it, it, it always uh, concludes the Easter season. So up until today, this Sunday, we conclude the Easter season, and it actually marks the beginning of the Christian church. Um, so you might say that it's the birthday of the Christian church today, what we celebrate on Pentecost. Now, it always occurs 50 days after the death and the resurrection of the Lord. Um, in 10 days after his ascension. So last Sunday, you know, it would be Jesus ascending into heaven, right? And then today it would be the descent of the Holy Spirit. You can't have Jesus ascend without the other, or you can't have Pentecost without Jesus ascending first. So that's why each year, uh, Pentecost, unlike Christmas now, Easter, you know, it changes, right? So you may say to yourself, is this going to be an early is this going to be an early Easter or is this going to be a late Easter? How many of you have asked that question, looked it up on the calendar? Whereas Christmas, it's always on December the 25th. And so Pentecost is always a movable feast, if you will. It's always movable because Easter moves. And so it's 50 days after that. It's 10 days after the ascension. And so it can occur anywhere between May the 10th and June the 13th but it's going to be somewhere in that time frame when we're going to celebrate Pentecost. And it's a really important Sunday because, again, it's the birthday of the Christian church. It's a celebration of the time when the Holy Spirit descended 
onto the apostles and Mary and some of the first people that were, uh, they were tucked away, if you will, in the upper room. The upper room being the exact same location where Jesus had the last supper, right, with the disciples uh, before he was crucified. So uh, when he sent the disciples into Jerusalem and they were going there, he knew, of course, you know, what was uh, coming ahead. But he sent them there, and so they had a place. They were familiar with that place. So it wasn't like it was a, uh, the upper room was not a place that they didn't know because they had just spent the last night with Christ there before he was crucified. And, you know, I kind of was thinking and saying to myself and praying and asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want me to say to these folks uh, here in Castlewood uh, today and then also in Bemis? What is it that I can say to them that's going to, you know, make a difference? What is it that you want me to say? Uh, use me to speak to them about their current circumstance. And so as it relates to the gospel reading, I thought, well, you know, you've been without a pastor now going on a year, Right. It was, about, it was about July of last year, right, when Pastor Terry left. And so you've been going through this circumstance of not having, a, not having a regular pastor, right? You've got folks like me that are filling the pulpit, but it's kind of different. And so, um, again, with that theme that I told you about, there's three themes. I'm leaving. Jesus is preparing his disciples the night before the crucifixion, you know. He talks to them about, he gives them a commandment to love one another. He washes their feet during that time frame. He does all of those things, but he's preparing them. I'm leaving. Now, I'm leaving, but guess what? You're staying. <laughs> you know, your pastor who represents for you Jesus, right, the leader of the church, right, um, he left. But he didn't leave you without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been here with you all along, guiding you, directing you, maybe getting you out of your comfort zone, yes? Because here's what happens. You know, you had Pastor Terry here for a long time, did you not? And so sometimes what happens is we defer everything to that person. And we're the church, and so that, the church is all of us. And so it takes all of us to make that happen. And so as you're going through this transitioning period and you're looking for a new pastor, right, just remember that you're being stretched and you're being um, brought out of your comfort zone. I mean, because before, you didn't have lay people up here doing all this, did you? I'm asking. No, you didn't. And so what's caused, what, and, and you did a fantastic job, by the way. You're doing a fantastic job. So I was looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, he, he might be their next pastor. I don't know, you know. <laughs> Just saying, right? The Holy Spirit kind of put that on my heart. He did a great job, you know, and so I'm thinking, not too many young folks can do what you just did, right? So that was awesome. Um, but anyway, so what, what does the Lord want me to say? Now I want to, I want to kind of change gears and I want to go to Acts, the reading that, um, that was read earlier. Uh, so I want you to stop and think about this for a moment uh, when we get impatient. That the Christian church begins with waiting waiting so Jesus tells the disciples you know wait for the Holy Spirit to come for there to be that power from on high to come before you before you go out when Jesus ascended up into heaven right the disciples are standing there they're in the Mount of Olives and they're looking up and they're just watching him ascend up and finally, it was two angels that came along and said, hey, buddies, get your heads out of the cloud. Now, I'm paraphrasing, mind you. Get your heads out of the clouds and go, go to Jerusalem where he told you to wait, right? To wait. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, patience is a really good virtue, right? I know it is, right? Because we talk about patience. That's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? But I'm not really good on that patience thing. I, probably like you, I will pay extra prime for Amazon so that I can get stuff two days quicker than I got it if I waited for the regular delivery of that now. Is anybody with me on that? Not being very patient, right? But we're called to be patient. And of course, you're having to exercise the virtue of patience as you're searching for a new pastor, have you not? And so sometimes that's very difficult to do. And so I know myself, I don't do such a good job on that. But on the day of Pentecost, we find the disciples, those that had just spent the last three years with Jesus day in and day out, right? And what are they doing? They're waiting. 
They're waiting in the upper room. They're waiting because they're waiting for power to come from on high. And so that's a clue for us, I think, that waiting is not such a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. So in our first reading from the books of the Acts, we're told that a strong and a driving wind filled the room when they were gathered, and their tongues of fire came to rest on their heads, allowing them to speak in different languages so that they could understand each other. Now this was such a strange phenomena that the bystanders that were watching some of this, they accused them of being drunk, of having drank too much wine. But Peter corrected them and said, no, it's, not, it's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. This is the phenomena and the works of the Holy Spirit. And so Pentecost is the fulfilling of Jesus' promise that we see in the Gospel of Luke, where he tells the disciples, stand tight, wait, stand by, you're gonna be clothed with power. And so I would say to you, you know, in relation to your waiting and your search for a pastor, the same thing. Stand by, wait, and you might say to yourself, well, how long is this going to take? Well, I don't know, but the Lord knows. And so he wants us more than anything to trust him. More than anything, he wants us to trust him. So right after Pentecost, it was, that's when Peter, after he had received the Holy Spirit, he goes out and he preaches his very first message. Now, this is the exact same Peter that not so terribly long ago denied the Lord. This is the exact same Peter that, you know, he, three times someone came up and said, don't you, you know him, you were with him. And he said, no, I don't know him. And so he lost his, he lost his courage. You know, he totally just abandoned. And, and listen, for the ladies in the church, right? When Jesus was being crucified, who was at the foot of the cross? It was the women. And the disciple John, for the most part. But the disciples, they hauled tail. They, they, they left. They weren't hanging out there, right? And so we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to give us courage. We need the Holy Spirit to give us fortitude, if you want to call it fortitude instead of courage. We need those things. So Peter now, who is emboldened by the Holy Spirit, is preaching his first sermon. And guess what happens? Thousands, thousands of people are converted. In fact... We, we know from Scripture that 3,000 people were converted from that message that Peter delivered. But was that Peter, actually Peter himself, that was delivering the message? No, it was the Holy Spirit working through Peter and working in the hearts of the people that were listening who became converted that day, and they were baptized. Now, the apostles and the believers for the first time were united by a common language. They understood what each other was saying. Now, how many of you in this church, you know, how many of you don't understand each other? Think about that. How good is your communication skills? Or are you like me? Sometimes when you have some folks that aggravate you maybe just a little bit, you just tune them out, right? You just go someplace else. You check out, right? I know I've done that. I know I've been guilty of doing that. But in this situation, they were all of one accord. That's what... The gospel tells us that's what Acts tells us. They were all of one accord. So not only were they waiting, but it took some time. And it took some time for them to start speaking the same language, to, to having some unity in their thought process and what they're doing. And that's, that's pretty normal, and we see it here, and this is a good guideline for us. So this notion of Pentecost Sunday, is that just a historical event, something that took place way back when, or does that have some kind of relevance for us today? And so I asked myself, and I asked the Lord, what has this got to do with the folks in Castlewood? What is it that you want them to hear and know about Pentecost? So I want to go back to, to the theme of waiting. Before the disciples could do what they did, which was quite miraculous, right, and, and mysterious, they had to be clothed with power. And I'm going to suggest to you that in this time of waiting, for a new pastor, that you, you need to be asking God to clothe you with power. And you need to be listening and speaking to each other and ultimately come up with one accord. So if there's any differences among you, that needs to be worked on. Okay? Is that okay? Oftentimes, you and I, we dream our dreams of what we want to, to do for God. You know, I do that, I, and I'm guessing that you probably do it too. So we formulate 
uh, these plans uh, and our priorities. And then we pray for God and we ask God to, to bless our efforts and to help us accomplish our goals. I mean, because after all, we're doing it for the Lord, right? I mean, think about the reversal on that. What if, instead of making our own plans and then asking God to bless our plans and help us to accomplish our goals, what if we started with, Lord, I don't have a clue what you want me to do today. I don't have a clue what your game plan is for Castlewood, for First Presbyterian. But Lord, whatever that is, will you open my eyes and will you open my heart and open my ears so that I can see and know your will and help me to go there instead of the other way around? And it makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes we even mobilize our uh, follow believers into the schemes that we create. Uh, and what really, is, what really is important, though, is that we step back and we ask God first and foremost, Lord, what is your plans? What is it that you want to accomplish through us? Now, there might be some other times during this waiting period when we can't understand why we cannot do what we want to do or at least why it's not happening faster than what it is. We get really impatient with that stuff. And so those are times when God brings waiting on purpose. And he appears to be unresponsive, but really he's not unresponsive at all. And so sometimes what we do in reaction to that is we get busier. And we start just doing other stuff. But I want to challenge you that a time of waiting may be something that the Lord's wanting to use to sanctify us. To make us holier. It might be a time that he sets apart uh, to be made holy so that we're listening and hearing and we're seeing him. I know you know the story of Peter and the disciples being out in the boat and the storm coming, right? Oftentimes when Jesus sent the disciples out in the boat to go across the sea when he was still stayed back on the shore and was praying, he knew good and well when he sent them out that they were going to face a storm. He knew good and well what their reaction was going to be, just like he knows what your reaction and my reaction is going to be whenever he gives us some adverse situations. And what he wants us to do more than anything is to not look at the sea, not look at the storm, not worry about all the turmoil and all the politics and all the hiccups and all the stuff that's going on in the world and here, and he wants us to focus solely on him. He wants us to have eyes only for him. And so sometimes the Lord gives us um, these situations where we have a time of waiting or we have a time of challenge where we don't feel like the Lord's talking to us on purpose. Just like he gave the disciples that direction. Go out. Go ahead and I'll join you later. So that we can have those experiences so that we fall on our knees. You know, some people talk about COVID and they say that COVID you know, has brought us down on our knees, right? And caused us to have eyes just for the Lord, right? It slowed us down so that we could have some time with our families, right? Because we're so busy all the time. So learning to wait helps us to develop uh, this discipline that I, I want to call spiritual perseverance. And perseverance is more than endurance. Just, you know, give it to me, I can take it. Just give it to me, I can take it. No, it's more than just endurance. It's combined with absolute assurity and certainty that whatever it is we're looking for, it is, it's going to happen because we know that God is faithful. And we know that while we're waiting on the Lord, uh, we're not just hanging out and doing nothing, but uh, like the disciples, we have an expectation. We're expectantly, not idly, waiting for the Lord to do something really, really wonderful and really, really great and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, how can we engage in such uh, expected waiting like the disciples did? Well, there's some things that's in the scripture in the, in the book of Acts that they tell us that I'd like to take a little closer look at. Number one, um, the first thing we notice is that they went to a particular place to wait. They went to the upper room. Jesus told them to wait there until they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. So they went to a particular place. You come here, this is a particular place. You faithfully come here every Sunday, do you not? You faithfully come here for different activities throughout the week, but you come here faithfully 
because this is where you encounter the Lord. And so the Lord's saying, go here, go there, wait until you're empowered on high. So that's the place. So wait, pay, wait faithfully. The other thing that the Lord said uh, to the disciples, they weren't, just, they weren't just there waiting. They were there waiting prayerfully. So they're faithful in what they do and that they come Sunday in and Sunday out. They're faithful that, you know, they're, they're fulfilling. And, th and they're still doing the things th that you did when the pastor was here. You're probably doing more. I know you're doing more than when Pastor Terry was here as you're waiting for a new pastor. You also have to do it prayerfully. And prayerfully involves, you know, always keeping your eyes on the Lord and asking him, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do today, right? What is it that you want me to do? I was talking to the two ladies uh, earlier when I was having a cup of coffee, and they, they faithfully, every Sunday, they're cooking your lunch or they're fixing your lunch. Faithfully. How many years have you been doing that? Huh? For a long time, okay? She's modest. Modest for a long time, okay? So whether, the, whether it's raining or whether the sun's shining, you can take it to the bank that they're going to be cooking you or fixing you dinner of some sort, right? You know that. If you're hungry, you can come here and you can eat, right? That's a good thing, right? For a long time. You're very modest. Thank you for that. So, prayerfully. The, other, the third thing uh, that the disciples did as they waited, uh, they waited faithfully, they waited prayerfully, uh, but they also waited in one accord. And that's sometimes where we get trip, tripped up, just like the rest of the world, right? We get tripped up when we're not of one accord. What does that mean? That means some congruence, some agreement, some, some working together so that we're one, right? We're one. And so I, I think that that's probably still a work in progress, coming together and being one. Maybe every, am I right on that? Or, or are you guys still working on that uh, coming togetherness stuff? Yes, I'm getting some eyes that are saying, yeah, we're still working on that. That's important. It's scripturally, okay? So you've got to be faithful. You've got to be prayerful. And you've got to come together so that you're in agreement with each other during this time of waiting. Then they're, you know, determined to wait for God to answer your prayers and not, not get ahead of the Lord. When we get ahead of the Lord, that's when we mess up, right? That's when we get and we say, hey, Lord, can you bless what my plans are? Can you bless what it is I want to do? Right? We've got to turn that around and make sure that we put the Lord first. Before we can announce the message of, of God's reconciliation to the world through Christ, we, we have to work on reconciling our own relationships inside the church. Does that make sense? And the other thing that I would share with you is that, um, number four, is that not only do we have to reconcile our own relationships before we can witness to the world inside the church if we're going to be the body of Christ, right? We also have to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing in service of the Lord, that it's in alignment with God's purpose and His will. If we're trying to do something that's not scriptural or outside of God's purpose, then we're not in alignment with the Lord. And that's a problem. That's a problem. So we need to be biblical, right? We need to check and make sure that, you know, what we're doing, that the Lord's okay with that and that we're within his purpose, within his will. Those things are important. So as you wait uh, for your pastor, you know, give thanks to the Lord on this Pentecost Sunday and ask him to continue to bless this church, this gathering, this body of Christ. Ask him, you know, be faithful be prayerful be of one accord and then ask yourselves as a church as the body of Christ Lord are we doing everything that we should be doing and are we in alignment with your purpose and your will and I guarantee you when the Holy Spirit comes down on you and you've waited and you've been patient and you've done these things faithfully and the power from on high comes upon you that there's nothing they can stop you. You'll be just like the disciples. You'll turn Castlewood inside, inside out. You'll turn Castlewood upside down. There won't be any empty pews in this place. That's a promise.
I think that's what the Lord wanted me to tell you today. Amen. Him today is Spirit of God, descend upon my heart on page 132. Let the Lord bless you and keep you. Let the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.